The next um, education bill on our list is uh, 106. Um, and, and are you here, Rep. James, are you here for that one? Uh, I am, Chair Hooper. Yeah, please. So I, you now know how we handle it. If you could probably give us a high level so that we understand broadly what this is trying to accomplish and we should be asking our questions around you know, the reason you're in here. So the appropriations part of 106. So committee, if you pull out that bill um, and we'll turn this over to you, Rep. James. Um, thanks, Chair Hooper. And I, I know I ought to be succinct and I, I will be, but I, I do need to start by telling you a very quick story, um, which is that in 2019, I, I traveled to Denver to attend an education policy were a conference, a national conference um, with Chair Webb. And I attended a workshop, a presentation on community schools. And it was, it was fascinating and inspiring. And I learned about community schools that had been established all over the country, but mostly in cities. And so I came home and I wrote to the uh, Education Commission of the States and asked if this work was being done in any rural communities um, to their knowledge and got an email back almost immediately saying that a leading example was Molly Stark Elementary in Bennington. So um, I just thought that was fantastic. And a couple months later, um, Chair Webb and I went down to visit Molly Stark. And on the day we arrived, um, a truck from the Vermont Food Bank was set up outside and parents and families were walking over together to pick up boxes of fresh produce and recipes. We toured the school and saw um, a room that had been set aside for a dental chair where a dentist from the community came to volunteer um, his time to provide basic preventive dental services to students. Uh, they had an audiologist on staff um, to do hearing screenings, um, not on staff. Again, it was a partnership. They have extended hours at Molly Stark so that working families can drop their children off before school and pick them up uh, later. They do summer camps uh, focused around lit literacy, um, academic evenings with parents. I, I just, I came away so profoundly inspired and that is a community school. Um, so to walk you briefly through the bill, um, we're proposing a demonstration grant program that would tap into ESSER II funds um, for a three-year program and we did adjust the date of the bill um, so that we could fall within the timing that we all just discussed. So um, eligible uh, SUs or districts that apply would receive funding for three years um, starting in 21 and then 22 and then September 23. So I, I understand that we need to talk a little bit more about what obligated means, um, but our thought was that this would come out of ESSER II and fund um, a three-year program for the successful applicants. Um, in order to qualify or apply, you do need to um, either, uh, you, you need to hit that 40% mark for free and reduced lunch. So we're looking for, um, we're looking for schools or districts that have um, hit, a, hit a poverty threshold basically. Um, and the reason that we envision this as a three-year program is that we took testimony um, from the Learning Policy Institute, which is a, a leading think tank on this nationally, that it really takes time um, for a community schools model to take root. You spend a lot of the first year um, with your community schools coordinator um, doing a needs assessment, mapping the, the programs that you might want to bring into the school from your community, and taking a look at the unique needs of your families and students. And then you develop a very unique program tailored to your community and your families and your students and start to roll that out in years one, two, and three. So this is not something that you can just take off the shelf um, and install in your school overnight with the flip of a switch. Um, Community schools are, they're unique everywhere that they're uh, implemented, but according to the Learning Policy Institute, every community school has four basic pillars. And there are other pillars you can add, but the key elements are that you offer some sort of expanded learning time or expanded learning opportunities 
So at Molly Stark, for example, um, those extended hours in the summer programs, you integrate student supports. So you bring some of the support systems that your families and students need into the school or find a way to provide easier access to them. So for example, at Molly Stark, the dental chair. Um, you engage families and communities in educational opportunities. So you're really looking for a level of family engagement and you build a collaborative leadership model. Um, so as we envision this, um, the funds would be used either to hire a community schools coordinator, and we've taken extensive testimony, research shows that designating a person to do this work is key to the success of the program. You, you can't just say to the social studies teacher, hey, why don't you do this in your spare time? Um, so the funds would be used either to hire a community schools coordinator or to designate someone maybe who's already doing that kind of work um, to take over that position. Um, according to the bill, I would imagine that maybe about 10, 10 districts um, would qualify, maybe 12. And uh, again, they would receive that funding for three years of ongoing work unless the AOE finds that they're not, you know, that they're not for fulfilling the needs of the grant. Um, gosh, I, I think I'm, I think that's an overview. <laughs> I think that's a great overview. Thank you. Sure. Um, and you answered uh, one thing I was just wondering about. So you anticipate that there could be um, 10 to 12 districts who fall within the criteria that you described in the bill, which is basically 40% of um, the e experience, their population experience is 40. No, I, um, so I should clarify that. Um, okay. So I took a look at the um, free and reduced lunch stats on the AOE page. I, I downloaded their spreadsheet and um, I did a, a hand count. So please don't quote me on this precise number, but there were about, um, I'm gonna say 130 schools in Vermont that met that criteria. So originally, and the bill has evolved quite a bit through our work with AOE and um, the V's as we call them. Initially, this bill envisioned single schools applying for the money. So I had thought, okay, there are gonna be at least 120 schools that are eligible. Then we decided it might be more effective to allow, um, and in, in testimony from the V's, we decided it would probably be more effective and um, a better bang for the buck on the money to have the district, have the program be lodged at the district or even the SU level. So how it's worded now is that you have to have an eligible school in your district in order to apply. And I have to admit, I haven't done the math to see how many districts SUs contain those 120 eligible schools. Did that make sense? Yes. Um, <laughs> thank you. Sure. Um, we have some hands. Uh, Rep Feltus. Well, it's along those same lines. If I took the 1.529 that you're just thinking of appropriating and you divide it by the 330,000 over the three years, that's only 4.6. And I thought you meant schools, but maybe you mean a full district. Again, that's, a, I understand the need that, or I understand what the purpose is, but again, that's not a very broad reach, I don't believe. So it's 1.5. Is that calculation correct? It's 1.529 per year. So oh, for a year, for a year. I did. Okay. So, um, and again, this is, right. you know, this is as bills evolve. Um, the original thought um, was that the money would be used only to hire a coordinator. And um, I worked with um, the NEA and you figured that, um, that that would hire 10, I think the math was that we would hire 10 coordinators, 10 schools, and then there was set aside money for the AOE. So as we shifted the idea sort of later in our testimony, 
to allow the funds to also be used to maybe designate a coordinator and implement the program. It became a little bit more um, that the AOE might have a little bit more flexibility that it wouldn't be quite so rigid. So I could see, for example, one SU coming in um, with um, a grant application of 110,000 to hire a coordinator. Let's say that they're starting a little bit more from scratch. So one SU with maybe they have three or four eligible schools and they'll come in and say, we'd like the $110,000 to hire a coordinator. And that's what we're gonna use it for. Another SU could maybe come in, well, we've got somebody already doing this work. Um, we're gonna designate them as the coordinator. Um, we might need to raise their salary a little bit. And we might also use the funds within the, within the grant to do X, Y, and Z work. And so it became a little bit more flexible and when the AOE, assuming this bill moves ahead, the AOE I think is gonna to have to develop grant guidelines um, that accommodate that flexibility. And it's up to a max of 110,000 per application. And then again, we built in that money for the tech support at the AOE. So it, might, it could very well be that if I hauled out my calculator as the bill evolved very quickly in the last couple of days to allow this flexibility that we might need to tinker with the the amount a little bit. Okay, we need to get the amount right. I mean, that is one of, so I think I just got confused. So okay. we have demonstration grants that are allowed to districts of up to 110,000 a year. Yep. Does that mean they would receive these for three, uh, up to 110, times three years right. potentially. Okay, so potentially each district could receive 330,000 over the three year period. Yep, max. Max, yeah, and it could be less. The could agency, less. yeah, the agency of, of education is going to manage this and is going to look at the requests and say, you get this much and, and the other one gets that much, but they have to live inside the proposed appropriation of 1.529, which is an annual appropriation over a three year period. Um, and again, I assume that's from the Essers money also. Yep. Did I see Jim is shaking his head. No, who is? Jim. All right. Well, you know what? We probably ought to let Brianna show us what she understands this to say. The fiscal note, they lay that out clearly. So I see three hands. Are they all questions about how the money works as opposed to policy questions? Yes, my question goes to, I, I think the bill only allocates 1.529 million total once. for the for once okay. for the three years. And that's the ah. issue. Ah, okay. So let's figure that out. How about we let Brianna show us the fiscal note and see how the pieces come together. We, so Ms. Parker, excuse me, Ms. Parker. Thank you, Chair Hooper. Can I go ahead and share my yes, screen please. with you again, yes. if that's all right? Um, so this is for H106 and I'll go ahead and just jump down here to the fiscal impact. Um, again, we are looking at using the ESSER funds um, for FY22 uh, for the total amount of the appropriation of $1,529,000. And so from my understanding, this money must be appropriated in FY22 and to be used over the three year period as the way that I understood that. Um, so, you know, I think that is kind of the span that we're looking at again, kind of raising the question of obligations versus use. So, I don't know if Jim has anything to add to that as well. I, I just say this, my understand, understanding of the language is the same. The 1.529 uh, 1. is, is over the entire three years. Um, 
appropriated in fiscal year 22 for a three-year period, according to what the bill language says. Okay. And so, Jim, maybe you can help me then, because we've had, uh, and maybe I'm just having a math uh, wiring crossing. We have talked quite a bit in committee about a maximum grant of 110000 per school uh, for, you know, 10, 10 to 12 schools. We've most often, we, we've most often talked about 10 schools. Yeah, so we had an email exchange on this recently uh, prompted by a conversation with JFO as to how this worked. And so we went back, back both on the um, uh, 101 and 106 with, uh, I believe it was uh, Chair Webb and with you um, talking about it, it was an appropriation for over three over the three year period or each year. And what I got back from that recently was it's over the three years. So we can change that, um, but that's where it's drafted now based on those email exchanges. That, that is certainly the way we're reading it. And more importantly, that's the way the fiscal note reads it. So um, that's a fairly substantial difference. Uh, and so it looks like there needs to be a conversation about that that needs to be resolved before we can consider the bill um, or make a decision on the bill. Jim? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative James, it, uh, you know, just getting back to the bill itself um, and putting aside the discrepancy and the, you know, ongoing funding that's uh, pictured here for three years. Um, it, it sounds like a, a, you know, kind of a creative and unique program that uh, could be very beneficial in a few cases. Uh, I'm wondering if if this has proved successful, what's the next step? Um, uh, would you then be looking, I mean, what's the sustainable funding um, to, to go beyond the next two or three years? Well, we talked about that um, in committee, um, Rep. Harrison, quite a bit. Um, and it's envisioned as a, a, you know, as a very uh, sort of defined three-year demonstration grant program with an endpoint. Um, and the idea around that is that when it's over, um, we would have 10, <laughs> 10 um, programs that would show results. And there's a study due back um, by the AOE um, after the first year and after the final year, specifically so that we can take a look at what the outcomes have been. And um, the conversations we've had in the education committee have revolved around, well, then what? Um, and I think at that point, these programs uh, will have either you know, shown their worth or not. And a future legislature could take that up if we wanna find a sustainable source of funding or um, the schools that have been involved could take a look at rolling that into their budget if the voters approve that. Okay, and your committee vote on the bill? Nine, two. Okay, thank you. Yep. Um, okay, so some work uh, uh, Representative Jessup? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rep. James. A quick question. How long has Molly Stark uh, been doing this model? Um, you know, I'll have to go back and check the exact date, but I'm going to say 20 years. Uh, it's, it is a long-standing model. Um, and we had them into our um, committee to testify and uh, it was work that was started. Actually, it was sort of interesting because um, Doug Racine had been involved in and very uh, sort of enthusiastic about the establishment of this program at Molly Stark years ago and has been kind of following their, their progress. So I can find the exact date for you, but the program at Molly Stark is longstanding. Um, there are some newer programs. Um, for example, at Winooski, they have an in school health center. Um, the school donated the space and doctors come in to provide a health clinic. And that's a newer program, you know, a couple of years old. Right. I mean, the reason I ask, please don't, don't create more work for yourself. The reason I ask is 
I'm pleased that the answer is that it's been a long time because that suggests that the community and other actors involved consider it worth doing and it has lasted that long, which again, that's a data point of one and I appreciate that. But I've also um, attended conferences, not the same one as a matter, but different ones where I've had some very in-depth conversation with colleagues from around the country and I know, for example, the state of New Mexico has been doing some extraordinary work in this area too. And it has ended up decreasing the pressures on social services in the area. And it's uh, in, in rural impoverished communities. And in their case, they have a large Native American population as well. Um, there were simply no dentists, period. So I think it's this demonstration project, I'll, I'll be curious to see where this conversation goes, but I think there is a parallel potentially in decreasing pressures on other budgets, um, but thank you. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Um, that's one of those statistics is in the findings. Um, they've done uh, quite a bit of study work on, on some of the programs in New Mexico. And that was where we received the information that hiring a community schools coordinator is really key to the success of these. And I, I think they showed a social impact ROI of um, $7 for, for, every in, for every dollar you invest in hiring a community schools coordinator, you get a $7 net you know, social impact ROI over time. And another, um, another uh, program that's very innovative is called um, something, it's in McDowell County, uh, West Virginia. And they have a countywide model with community schools at the heart of it that's um, aimed at, it, it's basically a countywide economic uh, development and economic recovery program. The entire county is involved, um, social service agencies, businesses, all kinds of nonprofits, and they have the community school model as one impact of an economic revival in that rural uh, county in, um, in McDowell County, West Virginia. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I'm a wee bit concerned about time. Uh, Representative Feltus? Yeah, thank you very much. And I know we're short on time. I'm just a little concerned in terms of understanding where you believe that these, these four pillars of the community school are all great. And, but my, as I read them, I'm thinking my local school district does much of this already not with one single coordinator, but for instance, you know, there's an, event, an expansive after school program and a summer program. There is a social worker who works with the schools, with the families in, in order to help them with housing and transportation issues and nutrition issues. We don't have a dental clinic at the school, that's for sure. But, and, and there are people who work, you know, with school programs to get families engaged in the community. So these four things are done partially at least in my school, and I think uh, quite a bit in my district. I I'm wondering how that compares to other districts. I would assume other districts already have some very um, advanced levels of these four elements. Have you discovered that that's not the case and therefore you want to promote this with specific funding for it as opposed to the individual school district doing it on their own the way they are now? Yeah, thanks, Rep. Feltis. That's a good question, and it is one we talked about um, again with this with the V's, with the Superintendents Association, and the NEA, and the uh, Principals Association. And I think um, you can think about it in two ways, and it's why it's good that it's a demonstration grant program. Um, some of the schools or um, districts that are already doing this work. Um, may be able to apply for a grant or may be interested in applying for a grant to really turbocharge it, right? To give that work um, the sort of impetus they need um, to take it to the next level. Because I believe, and I think we could, we could easily find testimony that really this is the way schools are evolving. If COVID showed us anything, it's the role that community schools are increasingly playing in providing these kinds of services to families. So you might have a, a school or a district like yours that wants to apply for this grant because um, you know, maybe they wanna designate a coordinator and take this work to another level. Or we might have schools, and I'm sure we do have schools, that look at schools like yours and think, wow, we really need to go there. How do we do that? And that would be um, perhaps a successful applicant that would want to start, you know, maybe they're not as far along as you. 
So this, this would allow the AOE to consider okay. an application from either. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Representative Iacovoni. I, I know the time is short and I, and I apologize. Um, this is exciting. It raises a lot of questions. Um, um, asking or requiring our accountable care organization to invest in these type of initiatives to help broaden it, to address the social determinants of health. But what I wanted to get back to was whether, did your committee talk about ways in which to collaborate or integrate these kinds of efforts with our parent child centers, with our community action organizations? Um, the prior bill triggered it, but I didn't have time to get involved. Um, we can do wonderful things for children in terms of literacy, uh, in terms of holistic approaches that this is doing. But if they go home to a place where mom and dad don't or can't read, um, um, the challenge gets a little bit bigger. So how do you try to, how do you try to reach out to the whole family? Um, so that's just a thought that I have, and I don't know if your committee talked about it at all. I'll stop there. I know our chair, uh, we're all anxious. We have to go to Thank you. Um, we didn't discuss specifically um, the concept of reaching out to, you know, the parent child centers, but that sort of work is exactly the kind of work that this bill would envision. Nice answer. Well done, Rep. James. <laughs> And again, this is really important work that we could that we are all interested in and could spend hours talking about. And I'm always sorry to appear to give kind of short shrift to important work. It's, it's just the nature of coming upstairs and walking through this particular set of doors. You, you mentioned um, Doug Racine having been involved in following the Molly Stark. Um, I, I have memories of an even more former secretary of the Agency of Human Services, Con Hogan, talking about wanting to make our, school, our schools the locus of these sorts of activities and actually do some of the work that Rep Iacoboni referenced. So there is a long story wise history of trying to do this sort of work. Um, so we have, we've surfaced some questions about the funding and how much money was intended to be here. Yes. Uh, yeah, so um, Representative Shai and Representative James are going to have conversations um, and figuring out what that looks like and we will sort that as we move along. So, um, I, I, I'm not seeing any more questions, but I, I think we've surfaced the questions we have with regard to the um, appropriations. And with that, we'll say thank you very much for your presentation on this.